I got into ethnomusicology almost accidentally. Um, I applied to the IU program in 19, well, probably 1996 um, as a folklore student uh, and learned about ethnomusicology as a word <laughs> and as a field of study about three weeks into my first semester as a grad student. I had always, I'd been a musician since age 13 or so, um, had always been really active in performing music, playing music, listening to music, thinking about music, had done anthropology as an undergrad, um, and had thought about how can I connect those two in graduate school. So that's what led me to folklore as a discipline. As soon as I got here, like I said, uh, one of the faculty at IU, Dr. Ronald Smith, um, he had looked at my application and he got word through one of the staff that he wanted to meet me and went into his office and he said, oh, I think you're an ethnomusicologist. And so I said, okay, I guess. <laughs> Sounds good, tell me more. <laughs> so he convinced me to take his transcription and analysis class. Again, it was already four weeks into the term, so I stumbled into that late. Um, was terrified because I couldn't read music or write music. <laughs> and so, uh, but I, I soldiered through and very quickly realized it. What the musicology offered um, was a way to sort of think about music as culture, music in culture, sort of the, the, the why people make music rather than the how is what I was really interested in. And ethnomusicology gave me a way to articulate that. So I did my training at, at IU, uh, started in 1996, and I defended my dissertation in 2004. So that's the, the, the years I was affiliated with IU. So ethnomusicology, I mean, I largely took advantage of the fact that the ethno program was housed within the folklore institute at the time, now their department, um, and really uh, blended across those, those bodies of knowledge and the theoretical backgrounds um, of, of the two fields, took advantage of the faculty across folklore and ethno. Um, but what ethno really set me up to do in terms of my career is think about the way that, that music and musical expression and musical culture um, sort of fit figures into communities in how people express identity, um, express ideas through and with music. And, um, and so I, I think my training at IU definitely uh, set me up to, to pursue those ideas in a range of professional settings, but always with that blended base of the kind of the folklore approach and the ethnomusicological approach. I think my, I believe my diploma says a PhD in folklore and ethnomusicology I think there was one or two years where, where that appeared. And so I, I professionally, I, I kind of embody that blend and have, so. Uh, well, my dissertation research was on um, rap and raga musics in Malawi, um, a project I stumbled into in traveling to Malawi and uh, was fascinated that all these youth, mostly males, um, were obsessed with Tupac Shakur and Biggie Smalls. And this, again, this was in, this was in 1998, so Tupac had been dead for four years or so, um, but everyone talked about him very much as if he was alive, and I, I needed to know more about that. <laughs> so, so that was a great research project that, that um, while the music was key in that project, what I was really interested in, again, I think this is what the training at IU provided, I was able to kind of ask questions about how these, these youth were integrating music and musical performance into their identities as Malawian youth at a certain time, you know, in, in 1998, 1999. And so uh, that was the first big fieldwork project I did, um, I guess outside of my master's project, but that was the big one that kind of set me on, on doing like ethnographic research in the musical culture. Um, the next project I, the next research project I started doing when we ended up out in Oregon and I was a faculty member at the University of Oregon, I started doing research into, um, boutique guitar effects pedal building and there was a an, an emerging community at the time this was probably in 2009 uh, 2008 2009 of people who were sort of hand hand building so very DIY um, uh, these guitar effects pedals um, now it's sort of a big business but these were all people modding existing circuits or creating new circuits almost in an improvisatory manner so I became very interested in improvisation DIY knowledge sharing of in digital realms of sort of analog gear. Um, and so I did kind of a hybrid in-person and digital ethnographic project around that. 
Um, at the same time, I was brought on board to do work with a project called China Vine that was a collaborative research project um, and cultural documentation project between two US-based universities and then a few universities in China. So I was brought on board to help um, integrate music and performing arts into that project because they had been largely doing visual arts and, the, and the, the principal investigators in the US wanted to, to get more into um, music in China but also other kinds of performance. So I, I helped um, do some ethnographic research with experimental musicians in China who were you know, doing noise and avant-garde rock who were very much referencing traditional Chinese musical practices. So I had the, the pleasure and benefit of going to China a few times and facilitating some of that interview work and the ethnographic work. In terms of applied research, I mean, I helped do some stuff in Oregon. I started doing some work because it, in Oregon I was a faculty member in an arts administration program, but I approached that very much as a folklorist and ethnomusicologist, looking at the communities around arts participation. So I started doing some work with the city of Eugene, helping think about how to document public art installation from a, like an ethnographic perspective. Um, and now what I do at the, at the Library of Congress is I help do uh, researcher support and researcher development in addition to public programming. So I've kind of merged my interest in public facing work with, uh, with ethnographic research and, and, and training and getting communities access to, to the materials at the library. I think my current position is, <laughs> is the highlight, so work backwards from that. I mean, when I started grad school um, here at IU, I think, I mean, it was a very different era, but I think I came to it largely because I was curious about how to, um, I was, I was excited and curious about the fact that I could learn how to ask people about why they did creative stuff. <laughs> so I didn't come into it thinking I want to train to be a faculty member or to do, that was not why I, why I got into grad school. Um, which I would not necessarily advise people to do now because grad school is much more expensive than it was in 1996. So I didn't really think about the investment I was making. Um, I benefited tremendously from some of the opportunities at IU to, to be a teaching assistant, to get research fellowships. Um, so, but coming in at the time I did, I think if I had to sort of name my ideal job, it would be the job I have now even though I probably couldn't have articulated that as a, as a first year grad student. So I think everything I've done kind of set me up to be where I am now, which is a career highlight. Um, all the work I did with the Lotus Festival here while I was at, at IU, the work I did with the radio station, um, WFHB, all the people I met here who really influenced me kind of set me up to be where I am now. Um, certainly uh, getting a tenure track job at University of Oregon was a highlight for me and being able to bring my folklore and ethnomusicology training kind of into the realm of arts management was something that was really exciting to me. Um, going to China was a career highlight and being able to do that kind of work. I think one of the, I mean one of the highlights of, of being at University of Oregon was working with graduate students which I really enjoyed doing in terms of not just mentoring and, and, and teaching them, but helping people find their own career paths, whether they were in the folklore program or the arts administration program. I would say that ethnomusicology is important, um, probably for multiple reasons, but one, just the ubiquity of music, <laughs> especially in the age of streaming and instant access. Um, it's everywhere, but it's really easy for for consumers of music of any age to sort of not pause to reflect on where the music's coming from, either historically, you know, legally. And I think ethnomusicology is, is as a discipline, is well poised to, to get those questions in front of people, whether it's in the classroom or in public and applied settings. Um, and so it, it's resonant in ways that it, that it wasn't when the discipline first emerged. And, and I heard some of that at the president's, the past president's roundtable presentations too, like people thinking about when, you know, when Bruno Nettle talking about like the questions we were asking in 1953, you know, we don't ask those questions now because we've learned a lot more <laughs> about the way music functions in the world, socially, culturally, um, you know, psychologically. And so that's, that's really exciting, I think. And so the discipline still has, 
has this amazing resonance right now. Um, and so I'm also convinced that ethnomusicology is important because it it tra it can train we can train ethnomusicologists to work in a range of settings, right? They can be working, you know, in at the kind of international cultural level. They can be working certainly with refugee issues, um, working uh, certainly in the realm of of intellectual property and copyright, working in arts nonprofits. So. I would always be advising students that even if the job doesn't have the word folklore or ethnomusicology in the title, your training as a folklorist and ethnomusicologist allows you to bring stuff to the job that is going to make you, maybe if not an ideal candidate, a best candidate. Um, and I think partly because, I'll stick to ethnomusicology here, um, because it's rooted in ethnographic practice and that really gives you tools to pay attention to the world and understand the world in ways that um, not everyone does. And so again, at the musicology, the focus on music and musical cultures is key, but also the focus on being able to kind of understand and interpret the world, not in a unified and holistic way, but in a sort of multiplicities is, is really what, what I think the discipline offers right now in the 21st century.